We're getting close to the end uh, with Lecture 19 and Unit 5, Revelation According to Islam and Christianity. Uh, is the Bible trustworthy? So this uh, is another <coughs> topic, but it's still under the same theme. Now, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the, um, it is true that uh, I guess in working with Muslims, sometimes this is not as major an issue, that is the trustworthiness of the Bible as it is in other contexts, but it certainly was a major issue where I was. Almost daily, I would be challenged uh, that the you know about the Bible. The Bible has been corrupted. The Bible has been changed. And uh, considering the fact that in I think grade five, the uh, children in school in Pakistan are they begin to teach them that the Bible has been changed. And so, uh, whether it's a major factor or not. Uh, it certainly will come up sooner or later. This lecture, I think, will be a little shorter uh, because uh, it's not it's not something that we're going to deal with in uh, totally in depth. But let's begin by talking about some uh, Muslim Christian comparisons as we get on to this, and uh, uh, I'm adapting this from uh, Robert Douglas, to whom I'm. Uh, certainly for whom I'm grateful. Uh, Islam, you see, is considered to be, as we look at this, the eternal speech. And Jesus is the eternal person, uh, the word in heaven, sent down the, in Islam, the Quran is sent down by dictation. In Christianity, uh, the word comes down via incarnation. In Islam, uh, the Quran is uh, the recited word on earth, on earth. In Christianity, it's the word as flesh. That is Jesus Christ. In Islam, the, the witness of Muhammad in Christianity is the witness of disciples. In Islam, it's the recorded in the traditions, which came uh, a long time after Muhammad, 150, 200 years. In the Christianity, it's recorded in the Gospels. For Islam, the exegesis is in the Quran, and in Christianity, you have the uh, implications or the teaching of the Gospels in Islam, explained in commentaries, and in Christianity, explained in the epistles. But I would say it also is in, explained in the commentaries. In other words, uh, theologians have done a pretty good job of of trying to explain what the scriptures mean. Uh, let's first of all look at definitions, be it ever so briefly. Wahi is that word for word, that word for word dictation that comes to Muhammad. In other words, it's, uh, it's not the same as we think of in Christianity where God uses the hearts and the minds of individuals, uh, even uses their education, whether they use uh, perfect Greek or their Greek is a little bit uh, sloppy. In other words, uh, not that it's incorrect, but just that you can tell uh, there's a difference in that sense. Uh, the Quran is from the mouth of uh, Gabriel to the ear and the heart of Muhammad. Uh, the, there is an internal as well. I, I should have said that uh, in the Quran Besides the Quran, we have the Hadith comes from the angel, but not by word of mouth. The impression, but not by word from mouth or word from the mind. Uh, there is other types of uh, uh, two as well as il like ilham that is uh, not proclamation, but uh, saints and others would lay claim to this kind. You have the in the eternal, which is obtained by thought and analogical reasoning. And here you have a tanzil, which uh, remember is the coming down, being sent down. And the hadith is some result of the wahi and utterances from God. Uh, certainly the kudsi uh, is coming from God. Uh, and it is some result of the 
of the wahi, but it's also some result uh, from the angel and uh, ilham. Now the agency, that is Gabriel. Gabriel is the agency, and he is the highest form of angelic being. And some verses are specifically to Gabriel. For example, uh, in 2 and, well, 97, it says, He brings down to thy heart by uh, the will of Allah, or Allah's will. And then 40 and verse 15 says, By his command he sent the spirit of inspiration. 16 and verse 2, he sends his angels with inspiration. And 26 verse 193, with it comes down the spirit of faith and truth. So there you have some verses uh, that uh, have to do with Gabriel. Now, the manner, what's the manner of inspiration? Well, God does not speak directly in Islam. He does not speak directly, and this is a difference, because in the Bible, God speaks directly to Moses. He speaks directly to, uh, to Micah, to Malachi, to Habakkuk, and others, uh, and they have this conversation. This is not true in Islam. Uh, there is an indirect uh, indirectness. Revelation, is it, is it at once, or is it gradual? Uh, there are verses in the Quran, like uh, Surah 44 and verses 3 through 6. It talks about the Quran being sent down in a, on a blessed night. That's the, the night during Ramadan, uh, probably the 27th, 26th, 27th of Ramadan. And most Muslims understand that uh, it started to come down at that time, during that month, and then continued on for 23 years. Uh, but it says in 2 and 185 that, um, the, that Ramadan is a blessed month. A blessed month. Why? Well, because that's the month that the, the Quran comes down. Uh, at least it's when it starts, as I mentioned. Well, Muhammad heard words, according to the Quran, 75, 16 through 19, but he was unaffected by it. Personally, there was no uh, situational thing here. In other words, Muhammad is like a typewriter. Uh, it's like a pipe that uh, God pours through him. That is different, you see, than the inspiration of people in the Bible. Uh, but there is proof, according to uh, Islam, that, that this was uh, from God. Now, the what about the books? Well, there are uh, other books as a result of Revelation. These were sent for guidance. Remember this, this key word here. We had a, a discussion at the mosque on Sunday um, with a Christian and a Muslim speaking, and the Muslim, very eloquent uh, fellow who teaches at the University of South Carolina, uh, said that the... Uh, Humankind needs guidance because, after all, he has uh, the sin is forgetfulness, and so he needs to be guided. He needs to be reminded, and so this is this is really what Muslims emphasize: uh, the need for guidance. How many sacred books? Well, uh, some Muslims think of 104. Adam received 10. Seth 10. Enoch uh, a number. Uh, Abraham, 10, Moses, David, Jesus, Muhammad. These were all recipients of divine books, and uh, the, the Muslims do talk about a 104 total, though there is no evidence exactly. In other words, we don't have those books uh, to check over. Then comes the Quran, uh, and the Quran confirms earlier books. It uh, claims to clear up uncertainties. It's perfect. And in the Quran 33 and verses 3 to 4, uh, it says that he sent down the book confirming what came before. What came before? Well, of course, the book of Moses, the book of David, the book of Jesus, but then uh, also 
the intimation is that the other books that we've just been talking about. Now the pre-Quranic books, um, particularly of Moses, David, and Jesus, were for a particular people, for particular times, and uh, and they are quite different, in other words, uh, than the, as we think of the Quran. The Quran is God's speech sent down. There are 114 surahs. Uh, I've said before that the Quran is about, uh, I think, four-fifths the size of the New Testament, and many Muslims have memorized it, some as early as 10 years old or even younger than that, uh, which is no small feat, uh, memorizing it, particularly when Arabic is not your mother tongue. Uh, the Quran and the Bible, uh, in, in comparing them, the Quran, <coughs> the tone is somewhat like the Psalms and the Prophets and the Law, but certainly not like the New Testament, uh, or not like the Bible, because the Bible roots itself in specific uh, events. Uh, for example, in the king, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, says Isaiah. Uh, it, it roots itself in geography, in dates, and in people. Uh, you know, by the River Jordan, such and such happened. Or uh, Daniel sees his visions by the River Tigris and Euphrates. So you have those, uh, you know, Jesus is born uh, in in the days of Herod and so on. So you, so you have this, this connection to history, geography, and other things where in, in the Quran basically that is missing. Now, sources and influence, um, we're not going to go into that, uh, but the Quran does does have themes. Uh, there is a collection of the Quran, uh, but it has never been really critiqued. Neither the collation, uh, not so much the collation, but the collection. The Quran is not a subject of uh, textual historical criticism by Muslims, though it is true that some non-Muslims have done it. Uh, not too long ago there was an article in the Atlantic Monthly where apparently Muslims were, some Muslims were left sort of speechless because it uh, had to do with a critique and uh, maybe someday this will happen, maybe someday uh, Muslims uh, would, would really look at their book in a uh, critical manner. You might have heard of the sources of the Quran that Ibn Warak has written and also has written the book Why I Am Not a Muslim. Now, as we began in the course, there are also many commentaries. There are many commentaries on the Quran and um, to be a good Muslim scholar of any influence at all, you have to have done a commentary, and there have been some significant commentaries. Uh, people have given their very lives, uh, have poured their energies into doing a commentary on the Quran. Translations, uh, you now have many translations, but they don't call them in translations, they call them interpretations, because, uh, you know, really, the Quran is untranslatable. However, Muslims have translated, and non-Muslims too, and have translated into uh, many, many languages, which uh, is a help to us, and certainly is, I think, to Muslims as well. Though the emphasis is not on understanding it so much as it is on memorizing it. One question that always comes up is, how much do you use the Quran in witness? There is... Uh, now the camel method that is being used, and uh, I think it's being used with profit, but I think it has to be used with discretion. Uh, yes, the Quran does give some very positive references to Jesus. Yes, it can be used as a launching pad, uh, as a bridge, but uh, tell students that we, we must not stay on the bridge. In other words, uh, eventually Muslims inquirers are going to have to get off that bridge 
and, and come to see Jesus in all his glory, all his uh, majesty, and they will only see him that way through the study of the Bible. So uh, it can be used with integrity, but uh, it has to, you have to be careful with it, uh, and you can get into trouble by using the Quran. There are literary forms in the Quran. Uh, there are certain claims as to uh, being a unique literary style. Um, and Muslims really believe this. I mean, grown men, healthy, uh, strong men will break down and weep at the words of the Quran. And uh, they will say that it, it's, it's, uh, it cannot be imitated at all. Uh, Muhammad, was he illiterate? Well, we have mentioned this, that uh, in 7, and for instance, verse 157, he is called the unlettered prophet. But it's hard to prove that he was really illiterate uh, from the word umi, more that he was unlettered. In other words, that he didn't know the previous scriptures. Uh, he was not well acquainted with them. And that is certainly true. The more you study the Quran, uh, you, the more you realize that that is true. He, he didn't have a good picture and he got bits and pieces here and there. Eventually he understood more, but by the time that he understood, I think, uh, enough, it was really too late. Uh, it has been, according to Muslims, perfectly preserved. What about prophecies? Well, We've also took, looked at that, uh, Surah 30 and verse 2 and 2 to 4. Not really, uh, not really prophecies in the Quran. Uh, there is a unity in the Quran. Uh, there is no doubt about that. Uh, Muslims will claim scientific accuracy and mathematical structure and so on particularly thinking of a book that I uh, was con confronted with in Pakistan by Maurice Bukhail, uh, a French person who wrote an attack on the Bible. And it was answered by William Campbell, who took off time from his medical practice to answer that book. Uh, it was really a problem in many parts of the Muslim world, uh, as, as you, I hope, can imagine. And, of course, the claim for changed lives. Is that true? Well, it probably is true. Uh, you can listen to testimonies here of people who have become Muslims and who have said, you know, my life was changed. I was this and I was that and I was, I was uh, doing this and that and, and now I have purpose and uh, some Muslims might even, be t might even talk about being born again. Well, uh, Certainly, it's only through Christ that we are re redeemed and changed from the inside out. But nevertheless, uh, we're talking now about the claims that are made. What are we going to do with abrogation? This is uh, widely accepted in Islam, though some Muslims have uh, refused it. And we could read one verse here. Uh, that's the wrong reference on the screen, by the way unless you have a different, uh, an, a different uh, uh, version. Remember, there are two. There's the Egyptian version and um, then Flugel. But uh, in the Egyptian version, it's 2106. It says, none of our revelations do we abrogate or cause to be forgotten, but we substitute something better or similar. Knowest thou not that Allah hath power over all things. So uh, there, are, um, there are verses in the Quran that indicate this. Like, uh, you know, what are you going to do with, uh, with verses? Uh, it once has, at one time it says uh, fight against them, another time it says there's no compulsion religion. So there is a problem and uh, abrogation is one of the ways that uh, uh, in fact, it's, it's, it's official in, in many ways, but as I've mentioned, there are not all Muslims who buy into it. There are different types of abrogation, and I'm not going to spend um, any time talking about this, but the question is always how many? How many verses 
are abrogated and uh, is it uh, is it five or is it 200 225 uh, what do you do about this is it okay to drink uh, is it okay to come to p prayers after drink drinking uh, but so there is some problem here uh, in clarity and uh, the way that it has been handled is abrogation now thinking a little bit about Quranic interpretation uh, there are claims made that the Quran is easy to understand uh, that says that, that uh, it makes all things clear and there are I think about seven references that the Quran clarifies issues there are two kinds of verses uh, there is the uh, uh, those that are clear and those that are somewhat allegorical uh, in 2435 and 3372 uh, it says that God will com explain many things 7517 and then we've talked about the anthropomorphisms when it says that uh, God has a hand or God sits on a throne there came about the doctrine of Bilakaith you you take it but you don't ask how you in other words you accept it by faith I think that we can use this uh, in our discussions with Muslims because there is a lot of stuff that has to be accepted by faith and we don't understand everything and Muslims have had to cross that bridge as well